What is up? Welcome into this Monday edition of Pushing the Pile, presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. And as always, on Mondays, we have none other than Matt Ryan here to break down the quarterback play that we saw over the course of the weekend. And let's get right into it because we had the quarterback matchup that's been kind of the quarterback matchup of the past few years. Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, every time they meet, the game's been decided by three points, and yesterday was no different. Is Patrick Mahomes inevitable, though? Is he always going to be the guy at the end of this? What did we see from this matchup? I mean, it feels like it, doesn't it? It feels like, uh, you know, no matter how the game shakes out, he gets the ball in his hands late and finds a way to, to get the job done. You know, watching that game, though, uh, felt like the Bengals looked a lot better than they did week one, right? So they, they look like a different football team on both sides of the football. But, but you kind of mentioned it about Patrick Mahomes being inevitable. I go back to the Cincinnati drive that they had prior to the last drive Kansas City had. And so they convert the first th third down, which was good. I think they ran the ball on first down right after that. They had a second and six, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, I can't remember who was in the slot, but they had a second and six where they had a slot receiver and Joe Burrow missed behind, right? And, th and there's a chance to front pad or gut shot that, that football and, and get that first down. And that's kind of the margin of error that you're playing with when you go against Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs, right? Like you're gonna get one play. If, if you're in that football game, you got a chance to get it and, and put that game away. You're gonna get one play where there's an opportunity to really either bleed more clock, convert, move the sticks. And, and I thought Joe Burrow played pretty well. I thought he did a good job using the tight ends, but he had that one opportunity on kind of an inside slot short slant and, and missed and and really that's the margin of error that you have going against Mahomes because when he gets it back I think your guy's point is exactly right like it, it is this is what happens every every time he gets it they, they find a way to get the job done and I know there's been a lot of talk about the penalties or whatever both of them were, were clear-cut penalties so like there, there's no debate there they made the plays they needed to play or, or needed to make to win the game yeah, the defense stepped up when they had to. Obviously, Joe Burrow not able to, you know, put the spear in the dragon there with Patrick Mahomes, you know, being able to convert there on that play. But to your point, when you see that punt team on the field for Cincinnati and you see just enough time on the clock for the Chiefs, you know the Grim Reaper is over there. He's uh, he's shining up his scythe. He's getting ready to go back in there and take somebody's soul. It was no different uh, this this past game, and I've seen it in person. I've seen it on TV, and it always looks the same. Patrick looks a little bit too calm to be in that chaotic situation. He goes out there, he delivers a couple strikes, and then even that scramble drill. Take us through that scramble drill on the PI, on the fourth and forever, uh, where you see Patrick roll left and then have the ability to find a hole shot there um, on a sat down Rasheed Rice, and then the, the, the safety's got to fight through him. So as a quarterback, when you see a guy like Rice be able to throw the brakes on, and show you eyes what's going through your mind there well to be clear i've never been in that position of scrambling around that long <laughs> and making something something like that happen so i don't know exactly you know what's going through his brain at that point but honestly it's it's your only chance right like it's your your only legitimate chance in in those type of uh situations fourth and that and that long is to an ex, you know extend a play make it broken and try and catch them out of position, which they did. Uh, and, and to me, it's just become routine for them. I mean, we've seen this for years, like once a game, twice a game, three times a game, he's going to make these crazy play extensions. Uh, and then their receivers are just all on the same page. I mean, to me, that's, that's the biggest thing. It's, it's Patrick extending, but it's those guys also understanding when to put the brakes on, like you mentioned, where to find the soft spots, use their creativity, use the rules that they have in the scramble game too, uh, and, and make it come to life. It was impressive to see. Now, what, one more question I have for you. There's been a lot made on social media about the fact that, you know, this guy, Travis Kelsey, he's not as productive this year, but I seem to think that they're going to try to, they're going to try to keep their horse in the stable. Like a lot of these teams, they understand they're going to be around at the end of the season. Travis Kelsey clearly going to be used at some point in an extended role. But you mentioned it. It's those receivers on the same page with Patrick Mahomes. What's your level of concern for this offense and their lack of involvement with Travis Kelsey thus, this early in the season? 
I think they'll find, you know, they'll find their rhythm. Um, you know, everybody changes as you get older, right? And but Travis has has the knack of creating separation, not only with his wiggle, but using his body. So I think they'll find ways to to you know create space for him. He's he's not scared of the moment either, right? And so as you get later in the season, or, or you get to these critical third downs that they're going to have, I just I feel like he's the type of player that's going to find a way to get it done. My level of concern for them is the injury to Isaiah Pacheco. To me, that is, they have become a run first team, you know, and, and I love coming on here talking about the quarterbacks, but you, you look at them the second half of last season and what they did through the playoffs, uh, they're pounding the football. And really the first two weeks of the season are the same. I mean, they've come out running the football, being physical, uh, and he is is kind of the bell cow for it. And, and to me, that's where I would have, you know, probably my, my most concern for them for the next couple of weeks or however long it's going to be. I want to get back to the Bengals to tie, kind of tie a bow on this. Andre Yoshevich was the one who had a touchdown that game. I believe he was the one in that second and six yes. when the ball was behind. I couldn't him as remember well. who it was. Obviously kind of emerging as their secondary option to Jamar Chase. When T. Higgins comes back, do we expect business as usual from this Bengals offense? I know from week one to week two, we saw a big improvement. Do we see when T. Higgins comes back? Are they, you know, top 5-0 in the NFL when he comes back? Listen, I'm a massive, massive T. Higgins fan. I love him. I love his size. I love his physicality. I love the way that he plays. He's a matchup problem for people in man-to-man -man coverage. He's good with the ball in his hands. So I do expect an uptick uh, in what they can do. And if they run the ball the way they did yesterday, I thought they were much better uh, in the run game yesterday than they were week one. Uh, so, so I think, you know, that balance of not losing sight of, of running the football, being creative in the ways that they ran the football yesterday, you get T Higgins back, Gusecki had a nice game yesterday. You know, I think, I think you start to look at, I know these guys have started 0 and 2 for like the last handful of years and they've found their way as they start to get pieces back. I do think they're going to be competitive and they show, you know, they, they've shown they can go toe to toe. Uh, with the best of the best. And with the Ravens 0-2, it's going to be, uh, it's going to come down to the wire, probably a rivalry ga game there against the Baltimore Ravens. Well, me and Mike were talking about rivalry games and quarterbacks that we love to watch play. And for me, it's Mahomes against anybody. But for the most part, it's Mahomes and Allen. That's my favorite. People like Mahomes and Burrow. I really like the Styles make fights argument there with Josh Allen and for Patrick Mahomes. But we wanted to ask you, who did you get up for to go play against you know we we obviously know one guy in division who you probably got really excited to play against but is there somebody else that you had in mind or was it always drew Brees? i mean drew Brees. we 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 played against each other for so long right and uh he played at such a high level so to me and, and there's like the added the falcon saints rivalry is sneaky like one of the best in the league and i feel like a lot of people don't know about it but the two cities you know, you can feel the energy in those games. So to have a guy like Drew Brees that I went against uh, for so long, that was always a ton of fun uh, for me to compete against him and and try and you know outsling it, like go out there and and you know put up put up a game that that he couldn't handle. He got the better of me. Uh, I got the better of him a little bit. So it was it was a ton of fun. But in division, you know, I think back to like Cam Newton was a ton of fun to go against too, mm. and and he was a problem, man. He was. He was so physical uh, in the run game. You know, he, he would beat you with like 210 yards passing, another 80 on the ground, uh, and just seem to, to just, you know, ha have a way of, of dragging three or four defenders for like six yards as you think you're going to get the ball back, and he just extends it. So to me, those two guys in division uh, were, were probably the most fun to go against. Newton, former number one overall pick, lived up to the hype. A former number one overall pick that right now seems struggling to live up to the hype that we want your thoughts on, Trevor Lawrence. 0-7 over his last seven games now. The Jaguars, with all these high hopes, kind of in free fall after starting 0-2. Who are we laying blame on for the Jaguars' struggle so far of this offense? Well, I, I think there's a little bit to go around, you know, like uh, it's it's never, you know, just on one person. I think, you know, when you talk about, you know, losing weapons and Calvin Ridley, he makes this unbelievable catch for the Titans yesterday. There's a vertical threat that's gone. They've had some injuries at, at the wide receiver position. Offensive line, you know, their, their protection hasn't been great. But when you're talking about Trevor Lawrence, to me, you know, I really think, his struggles have been in the intermediate passing game. 
And so, you know, it's it's inconsistency in the in that middle section of the field where it's like from from eight to about 20 yards down the field. To me, it's it's where he's the most inconsistent with his accuracy, right? Like some are really good. His his highs are, are really high. And so the good throws are really good. But it's about bringing that that floor up, right? Like his ceilings up here, but his floor is down here with his accuracy in, in the intermediate passing game. Uh, and you look at just yesterday, like buzzing back through their tape yesterday, there's five or six different throws that that are kind of in that window from eight to 20 yards down the field uh, that are a couple are, are just not close. And then the other thing I think is even in their like short passing game, the quick game, he throws it so hard all the time, right? And so there, there's art to being a passer, right? And giving guys catchable balls uh, whether it's on those crossing routes that are short, that are really difficult for wide receivers and tight ends to catch because it's hard to track where that ball's coming, uh, you know, above or through kind of those windows in the offensive and defensive line. Uh, so I, I think a little bit of more touch uh, in, in that in that short passing game, and then he's got to improve his accuracy because those have been the the, the areas, you know, where he has struggled. But that's really the areas where you make your living as a passer in this league, right? He's been good down the field. He had a beautiful deep ball yesterday uh, that, that was gorgeous. And and that part's fine. Uh, but those only come up two or three times a game, right? You're going to have 15 to 18 pass attempts in that 8 to 20-yard window, and you got to make people pay in that area. Is that just who he is at this point now? He's in year four. That's been his MO, kind of even dating back to Clemson, right? I think that was what people said was he'll sail some throws over that area of the football field, and we've seen it kind of consistently throughout his career outside of spurts where he plays at a high level. Are we just to think that this is going to be Trevor for the rest of his career, a little bit inconsistent, who maybe has some high highs but also some low lows? I, I mean, it's it's four years in, and uh, he just got paid, and, and I'm happy for him. And, and I do think – like the good stretches have been very good. And so you're hoping that there can be more consistency there. You know, in his defense yesterday, the weather was terrible. And so, you know, you know, some of that, like I'll be the first one to put my hand up and say, I've, I've sailed balls, I've dirted balls, I've missed balls when it's raining or, or whatever. But we just need to see some more consistency. I'm not there to say, hey, this is who he is the rest of his career. I, I do think he can improve. Uh, and given his athleticism, it's not like he has to be the best in the league in this area. He's just got to be a little bit better. Yeah, and I mean, when, when you've got a guy like Trevor Lawrence, who's the unquestioned leader of your locker room, when you've got guys like you and me and Mike on here throughout the week talking about, is he the guy? Is this what we're going to get from Trevor forever? It doesn't really breed confidence. And to your point, I just think that they're not on the same page. I look at you know some of the things he said about Brian Thomas Jr. going in, going out of week one. He said the guy doesn't play like a rookie. He doesn't approach the things like a rookie would. Well, then I see him in the end zone bailing out to the left out of the pocket. Brian Thomas goes uh, on that back end line, left to right, Matt, and he throws it right mm -hmm. behind Brian Thomas Jr. So it's a mess up on Trevor Lawrence, but also a mess up on BT BTJ. He's got to have his eyes around in a situation like that. Your team's fighting to make a play. you got to be on the same page. Is that just going to take time, or is that something where – you think Trevor, you know, Trevor may be seeing ghosts bailing out of the pocket a little bit early and then the play breaks down? I don't think he's seeing ghosts. Like, I don't feel like it's in that space where his eyes are just gone, you know, as soon as that ball snapped. I do think it, it comes down to a little bit of continuity. You know, we were talking about it with the Chiefs before, right? Those play extensions and how it's just as important that the wide receivers are on the same page and understanding you know, how to create space, where to be in the right spots, where to set it down, where to put on the brakes, all of those things. I do think uh, a little bit of that, you know, takes time, but he certainly, like, the time is now, you know, the the, the time to correct it is now. Because uh, it'll, be it'll be a new regime. It'll be a new regime before one. we know, Matt. It'll be a new regime there before we know, and Trevor will Correct. be reinventing himself again. Yeah, I'll say this. I don't think at any point during Trevor Lawrence's career have they given him an above average offensive line or an above average wide receiving core. And now I think I don't care who you are in today's NFL, you're going to go through bouts of inconsistency with that's the case. And that's not to excuse that Trevor misses more throws than you'd like for a top level quarterback. But I think to call him a bust or to say he wasn't necessarily deserving that big contract. I just think they need to put a better team around him first before we have any sort of decision on that, because as it stands right now, I just don't think we'd be able to properly evaluate him. I just don't. 
a guy we have been able to properly evaluate this season so far because he is playing some lights out football. Well, we're going to talk about Kyler Murray mm. after this as Matt Ryan gives us his quarterback of the week. With quarterbacks around the NFL seemingly struggling through two weeks, one guy came out in week two and put up one of the best performances of his career. Kyler Murray, 17-21, 266 yards, three touchdowns, 59 rushing yards, and a trouncing of the Los Angeles Rams. This one was over by halftime, and he was out of the game early. What do we see, Matt, from Kyler to make you think that, hey, this might be the guy we were promised early on in his career? I mean... You, you saw he did everything that he's capable of doing. He was accurate on time at times. He extended plays with his legs. He threw the ball deep. He threw the ball intermediate. He found his targets. Uh, you know, I, I just thought is the best I've seen him play. The, the most complete game that, that I have seen him play in his NFL career and uh, came away from it yesterday just thinking, you know what, the Cardinals. And I got to give I got to give my guy J.J. Watt. Uh, a little shout out because during the summer we were talking about teams, you know, maybe flying under the radar or whatever. And he was like, listen, man, I was out at OTAs. I've kind of seen the vibe that is around the building in the Cardinals right now. He's like, I like it. It feels like the culture is changing there. Uh, it feels like they're headed in the right direction. They had a chance week one to beat the Bills. You know, they had them on the ropes. They played well up in Buffalo and then, you know, get their home opener against the Rams. And, and I mean, it was that was game over midway through the first quarter. I really liked what I saw from Marvin Harrison Jr. Oh, too. Yeah. Early, Obviously early goes over 100 often. early on. A couple touchdowns from him. And to me, the biggest thing that I saw from this Arizona Cardinals team, different from even early on in his career when Kyler was playing well, what was that, 2021 when we were hyping him up as maybe an MVP candidate before DeAndre Hopkins got hurt, before he got hurt, is they have a receiving core that's kind of built for options for everything now. You have the deep threat and Marvin Harrison Jr. You have more of a possession number two in Michael Wilson. You have Greg Dorch to be that slot. And then you have one of the better tight ends in the NFL and Trey McBride. So there's really no one go-to guy in this offense. He can just facilitate wherever he wants to go, basically. And, and that was his comments. You know, he took some heat for that week one, right? Like about his comment, the comments of, of saying, I'm going to go wherever coverage mm -hmm. tells me to go and my progression tells me to go. And the ball will then end up finding all of those different guys, you know, as as the year goes on. And I think that's the right approach, right? Like you, you've got to explain it clearly when you've got multiple pieces, right? Multiple guys that are playmakers for you. Like, listen, the ball's going to find you at different times. I need you to stay patient. I need to I need you to stay on top of of your route running and, and winning your matchups. And when it's your turn, make people pay. And, and I give, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. a lot of credit for having kind of that underwhelming performance week one in terms of production, but then coming out and, and having the day that he had. Uh, I, I think that also speaks to the maturity of, uh, of Kyler. Yeah, big time. I mean, and I love to hear that from a quarterback because as an O-lineman, like there may be a run in the run plan that I really like, and I, I'm going to be on the O-line coach's head the whole game. Like, you better call that again. It's, it's four to eight every single time that we call it. But I also have to know as an O-lineman, when we go toss left, it's going to help set up inside zone right. It's going to help set up Matty Ice to be able to deliver a deep hole shot um, to Julio Jones. Like, these are things you have to understand. If you're a good teammate, you have to have a little bit of that, you know, uh, 30,000 feet view of the whole operation. For Kyler Murray, he sounds to be really, he sounds really mature to me. And he's obviously grown up a lot, not only off the field, but his game reflects it as well. Yeah, for sure. I, I feel like you see that, you know, come through in his play. And, you know, we would always talk in our locker rooms about at times you're going to be John Stockton, right? You're going to be the assist man. That is going to be your role. We're going to need you to nail that role when it's your time to be John Stockton. But then there's times where you're going to be Steph Curry and we need you to shoot and, and we're going to need you to shoot from half court and drain it. And so that balance, like the good teams have the balance where they understand their roles on, on given plays and and I think you're starting to see that come through a little bit and I think that I think that's what really takes you to the next level as as a quarterback too right Kyler's been in this thing for a handful of years some ups some downs and I think if you can kind of weather that storm and and get out on the other side of it uh like it looks like he has in the first couple of weeks and and keep that rolling 
uh, I think the sky's the limit for him. Murray has definitely been the exception, though, through two weeks in terms of quarterbacks looking good. I, I feel like more often than not, we're talking about this guy struggling, that guy struggling. What have you seen from defenses across the NFL through two weeks that have kind of turned these offenses into checkdown artists left and right, that we're just not seeing the explosives, we're not seeing these attacking offenses that, you know, 10 years ago, this style of play that we're seeing right now would have been so foreign to the average football fan. I mean, I think it's hard to pinpoint, you know, one thing as to why, you know, numbers are down from a scheme standpoint or anything like that. To me, you know, and it's been harped on, you know, for, for the last month is, is like the lack of, of playing in the preseason. And, you know, passing the football, throwing the football in our league is about rhythm, timing, right? And being on the same page, understanding your adjustments, understanding when you're supposed to get out of stuff, understanding protection, right? Like you, you have to have a feel for how long you have. You have to have a feel for where you're at in the pocket, right? Not being too deep, not being uh, too short in your sets. I think all of those things as a quarterback come from, from live reps and, and being in there. And, you know, to me, I, I think that's probably the biggest reason you know, you've seen maybe some slow starts in the passing game. You want to talk about slow starts in the passing game. I was watching those Chicago Bears last night. Anything you want to touch on? I heard you talking about depth of drop for these quarterbacks. Is there anything you want to cover there on the Caleb Williams front as it pertains to the, the pocket integrity? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think I think when you look at, at Caleb last night, first of all, I thought he was a lot better last night than he was yep. in week one. He looked, he looked more comfortable. He's going to be sore today, though, man. He, 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 he got hammered a handful of times last night. Some of that's on the O-line. Some of it's on him too, right? I think one of the things you learn as a young quarterback in the NFL is that there are very specific landmarks where you have to be when you're throwing the football from the pocket. And, and we would talk about depth and location all the time. You know, on a five-step drop, rhythm or timing. So if you're taking three from the gun, which equals the old school under center five-step drop, you cannot be deeper than seven and a half yards, right? And and so that back foot at the top of your drop needs to hit at eight, and you better be climbing back into the center of that pocket in between the inside leg of the guards. And, and you better be at, you know, seven yards, right? Somewhere right around seven yards, because that's kind of the sweet spot for the tackles and enough space for for the inside guys to to kind of keep some 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 room. The other thing I see is when, when you're taking seven step drop timing. So some of those deeper down the field looks that they're trying to do, and you're taking five from the gun. There were two times last night where he was almost at 11 yards. And so I think those are things that are correctable. I think they're things that come from playing as a young player. Like this is an area where it's not about your skill set. It's not about, you know, uh, what you see down the field, right? These are very specific things that you get a feel for quickly. And unfortunately, a lot of times, like for me, it would happen from getting drilled, right? And and you would stand there and, and take one right through the through the chest and be like, oh, God, I was at 10 and a half yards. I was at 11 yards. So I think him learning to kind of get to the top of that drop and getting up into the pocket uh, is going to be good for him. And then, you know, I think, honestly, it's going to come down to a little bit better anticipation. And I think that's coming, right? I think those are all things uh, that you'd expect to see from a young player. And you'd expect to see get better as the year goes on. Uh, I think, you know, if he cleans those two things up, I think, you know, there's there's room for improvement because the way their defense is playing, their defense is playing good. Yeah. Like really good. Right. And so to me, they're going to be in ball games every week. And, and I think he's going to continue to improve. I think he took a step forward last night. Uh, and I think he needs to keep taking a step forward. I counted him up. Caleb Williams, 13 hits that brought him to the ground last night. Jaden Daniels had 15 hits that brought him to the ground between sacks, QB knockdowns, runs, where he got tackled. What do you tell, what do you tell a quarterback? What would your advice be to a guy who, those two, who are obviously kind of struggling to protect themselves early on in the game? Oh, you learn. You learn quickly. You keep getting hit, you learn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need to tell him much. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, they're smart guys. They'll, they'll figure it out quickly. But... It really is, and that's that's some of the benefit, right, of playing right away, is that these these kind of things that, you know, you're not even thinking about, right? Like when you're preparing in the off season, you're thinking about getting on time. You're you're thinking about your progressions. You're thinking about ball location. 
you're thinking about coverages, you're thinking about all these other things, you know, but the real experience comes from, no, no, I need to start with the first things first. I got to be in the right place, right, to deliver the football. And I think, you know, taking some of those lumps early is a good thing for these young guys. I think, I think they'll make their strides because, you know, no one likes getting hit. Yeah, I will say that's probably would make me, that's probably the biggest motivator is just the pure pain that you feel. It makes me want to get off the yeah, couch. Self-preservation, man. <laughs> There you have it. Thanks so much for Thanks joining us. Thanks a lot, Matt. Matt. He'll be joining us every single Monday. And another guy who'll be joining us every single Monday, Jonathan Jones. Oh He's boy. coming on to discuss some of the biggest storylines out of week two right after this. As promised, CBS Sports NFL insider Jonathan Jones joins the show. JJ! As he does every Monday. And we got a lot of grounds covered because there were some storylines that only JJ can bring us his insight on. JJ, we want to start with this. Malik Willis, third and ten, early on in that Packers game. He gets a snap from center Josh Myers only to find out that ball is covered in vomit. As Josh Myers had just ended pre-snap, have you seen anything quite like this? And what were they talking about after the game there in Green Bay? I cannot wait to hear Kyle Long's thoughts about this because as soon as I saw it, I said, I cannot wait <laughs> to get on P the P and talk with Kyle Long about what just happened with Josh Myers, who, you know, uh, he, he throws up, he vomits like moments before the snap. Right before and the you can see him turn his head to the left and he tries to miss the ball. But, like, it clearly did get on the ball Grabbing because it. Malik Willis then takes the snap. And, like, Malik Willis is right-handed. But then Malik Willis puts the ball in his left hand <laughs> on an obvious passing play and starts to run. And, like, you can see him with his right hand go grab for his towel. It was so incredible. And, Kyle, I just need to know, in all your years playing ball, and I'll even go back to baseball, right? Because you had the ball as a pitcher as well. Yeah. Have you ever done that, seen that, taken part, been party to something like this? I had a, my younger brother, Howie, he's a year younger than me. He was my catcher in Little League Baseball, junior high. And sometimes when I couldn't throw strikes, he would loogie on the baseball and throw it back to me. Um, and, you know, not very nice. But as an offensive lineman, I've been vomited on by D linemen before in junior college. got thrown up on on my thigh pad that was one thing I saw but the Josh Myers thing it was heroism at another level and for Malik Willis to take that football and not just dirt it immediately to get the vomit off it speaks volumes <laughs> about their commitment to excellence and I you know what I'm gonna take you inside the the O lineman's world a little bit before the game O linemen we're like ritualistic we eat the same thing we sit with the same people I can promise you Josh Myers ate spaghetti and meatballs before that football game what you saw was an amalgamation of meat pasta and, and bile coming together on the football. Malik Willis was like, screw it. I'm not a quarterback. I'm a running back now. I'm going to put this in my non-throwing hand. That's what I saw. It was disgusting, but it is just perfect. It's football perfection right there. Vomit on the football. Quarterback runs it. It's great. It was great for a Packers fan because obviously the Packers went out and trounced them. A team that did not trounce and is now 0-2 is the Tennessee Titans and their head coach, has become kind of the storyline after weeks one and two for some of his comments. <laughs> this past week, he's caught on video saying to co quarterback Will Levis after yet another mid-air toss, shall we say, Are you going to say what he said? He said, what the blank are you doing? Mm. He mouthed that. We can read lips well enough to hear what he said. Does Brian Callahan need a little media training, Jonathan? Oh, I mean, first of all, he only said what we all were thinking <laughs> yeah. or saying to, to our screens because I, I know I caught, I, I caught you caught yourself, Mike, because you, you were about to say interception, but it wasn't an interception because it was a, it was a, a backward pass. A lateral. So it was technically a fumble. Right, it was a lateral. So, I mean, y you want to call it an interception. It, it was a fumble there, right? And so, and they're in scoring range. There's, it's midway through the second quarter. And you know, against the Jets, against this defense, against Aaron Rodgers, your home debut, you're going to want these three points at the very least. So to do that uh, was asinine. And it was the second straight week of him doing it. And I know that Kyle can obviously speak to this much better, but these conversations happen very often. It's just that usually the head coach does not say it immediately when we all are saying it. 
at home. And Brian Callahan, just a little bit ago to the Tennessee media, I, I want to read this quote verbatim. He said, listen, I don't regret my feelings about it <laughs> or, or how I felt in the moment, which I appreciate. Where <laughs> sounds a lot like me Hell unapologizing yeah. to my girl, like, hey, hey you I know, like, I'm not sorry, I'm sorry for how I felt. You felt. Right. <laughs> Right. But he goes, he goes, I just think I can do a better job. I asked my players to control their emotions. I should probably control mine a bit better. So hopefully we don't see something like that again, but I would like to see if he can control them. It's a learning experience, guys. It's a learning experience for Coach Callahan, who's still a little wet behind the ears with the headset on over there as the head guy. And he has to understand that now you're the head guy. You're not the guy handing the headset to the head guy. You're the head guy. So the camera's going to be on you, especially immediately after a bungled play like that where Will Levis does something so asinine. But at the end of the day, I can relate to Will Levis. He's trying to make something happen, um, and, and you're down there. You want to get touchdowns, but to your point, field goals, points matter. And Pete Prisco says it all the time. It's okay to punt. It's okay to kick a field goal. It's okay to take a sack in some opportunities, in some instances. That's one of them. And if I'm Coach Callahan, it's a learning experience for me as well. You know, I'm new to this thing. I'm figuring out how the media operates. And with this young quarterback and the question marks surrounding him, it's going to be on me too every time. The cameras, it's going to be a two box. It's going to be Will Levis and Coach Callahan. So moving forward, I think we might see some sarcastic hugs at practice this week, maybe from the Titans media. You know, they're always like, look, these guys are getting along. It's so peachy down there in Nashville. Talking about another team that has a decision on their hands about will they make a change to quarterback. It's the 2-0 and Pittsburgh Steelers. Justin Fields was not penciled to be the starter week one until Russell Wilson went down with an injury. When Russell Wilson gets back healthy, is Justin Fields a starter or is Russell Wilson going to take the job back? The, the short answer is I don't know. Um, because when you look at this, like Fields is, is playing well enough for the rest of the Pittsburgh Steelers team to get the franchise a victory. Is he leading them to victory? Does anyone actually think that, right? I mean, there's been one offensive touchdown, I think eight field goals, and the defense has allowed one touchdown. Uh, so we have to be honest about what Justin Fields is delivering. I, I'm not voting for him in the top five of league MVP two weeks into the season. Can Russell Wilson offer more? I don't know. Uh, but I, will, I go back to when they signed or traded for Justin Fields, rather, and there were reports immediately, hey, Russell Wilson is QB1. And then we get into training camp, and, you know, the, the calf flares up for Russell Wilson, right? And he's an aging vet. And Russ is also the guy who has always thought – that he can just outwork everyone and outwork the injury. And we know that's not how calves work. And so now you have a, a Russ who can't push himself. You have a quarterback who's winning and not making a whole lot of mistakes. So I don't know that Justin Fields is winning this competition necessarily. He's not losing it. And I don't know the more that they win, the less that Mike Tomlin will be moved to make a change. Let's also remember the last time that we saw Russell Wilson out there for the Denver Broncos, he wasn't moving mountains either. So um, it, it, I don't know why you wouldn't continue with Justin Fields in week three, even if he hasn't really done anything to truly win it. He certainly hasn't done anything to lose it. I feel like Russell Wilson, I, I can't imagine him being a backup. You know, some guys they can be graceful, like Joe Flacco, he can have a graceful end to his career as a backup. Russ, if he's not a starter, I feel like he would lose his mind. Like, I feel like he's going to go crazy on the bench if they don't put him back in when he's healthy. Yeah, I could totally see that. But also, you have to understand that this guy, Justin Fields, grew up uh, idolizing and trying to emulate uh, Russell Wilson. You know, these are both baseball, football guys, and Russell Wilson was a dude at a certain time in this National Football League that was up there at the top of the list of dudes. And for Justin Fields, you get to be in the locker room with a guy like that, and I'm sure that their relationship goes a lot deeper uh, than we can see on the surface. But, you know, last week's win in Denver meant a lot to that football team. They meant a lot for Russell Wilson as well. He got the petty game ball back to Russell Wilson. I don't know if he's caught that one, J.J., but a, a real a, a vet move, classy move there by Justin Fields to, to tip his cap to Russell Wilson there. I think we're going to be moving on here from Russell Wilson and Justin Fields' talk. What do we got next, Mike? Well, next we have no more Jonathan Jones because, Jonathan, thank you so much for everything today and for joining us every single Monday throughout the season. What we have next is a little overreaction versus reality. We're two weeks in. Is everything we've seen going to play out the same way the rest of the season or are people going to come back down to earth? We'll answer those questions right after this. Thanks, JJ.
What is up? Welcome back. We're doing a little overreaction versus reality. We've seen some people meet or not come up to expectations through the first two weeks, and we're going to decide if that's what's going to play out the rest of the season. The biggest one, 0-2 Ravens, 0-2 yep. Bengals, two teams that we thought would be atop the AFC North. Well, they're re taking up the rear as it stands right now. Overreaction or reality, they both miss the playoffs. I could totally see both these teams missing the playoffs, but I definitely think if I had to pick one out of this group, it's going to be the Baltimore Ravens. They're not built up front to stop any type of pass rush, and you know that if your quarterback's off the spot, turnovers happen, turnovers, you don't get to make it to the dance. So I got the Ravens out of this thing. I trust Joe Burrow in that group more right now. Yeah, I think the Bengals still make it. Maybe that's just because I live in Cincinnati for seven years. we got breaking news, by the way. Oh, my gosh, we do. We have breaking news. I'm reading this here from We Tom. just – was it Jonathan Jones Jonathan, last segment? Jonathan Jones, we, so we're sorry. they're not going to do it week three. We are so sorry, Jonathan Jones. I will pretend that Jonathan Jones tweeted out what I'm about to read. Essentially, they have plans in Carolina to, to bench, bench Bryce Young. Bryce Young just got Dalton. benched. So, I guess that – we'll talk about that for the rest of the segment because that's massive, massive news. That is 18 games now into his NFL career. But is this a – rest of the season benching you think or is this a hey Bryce you were in a bad headspace bridge the gap between roster between roster weakness I mean right now with the way that that roster set up he's not going to get any more confident he's not going to yeah. get any any much better more productive you got to say just keep him healthy and hope to build again in the offseason you heard JJ talk about money players things of that nature to get your team better Let's see another iteration of it with Dave Canales. I'm not surprised, and truthfully, if I were in the same situation, I would think about it. And it was similar to what I said. I said it earlier today. He's broken. Uh, Bryce Young flat out looked broken. It, more so than even as a rookie, because the offensive line was not bad this week. They, they were not getting their butt kicked up front against this Chargers defense. He was Bryce bailing Young on progressions. Scared. He was scared of his offensive line. He was not willing to make throws, even with any sort of collapsing pocket. And when that's the case, when a guy's like internal clock has dropped to that degree, when he's not willing to push the ball down the football field, when he's literally going to his check down before his routes have declared down the football field, he's broken. And so I do think he needs rebuilt. And that wouldn't, was not going to happen with more playing time, unfortunately. So is this the end? Is it over? Is it curtains for Bryce Young? I mean, it's about as bad a sign as he can get, right? I'm not going to write anyone off, especially given how well he performed early on his career and who he is as a person. I saw a few quarterbacks this past this past weekend that played that were written off by some football teams. So for exactly. Bryce Young, it couldn't be it could not be over, but it also you know got to get better, dude. Yeah, but it's you're the Carolina Panthers. I think regardless of what happens, if you're holding that number one overall pick, that number two overall pick, that number three overall pick, it's no longer just put weapons around Bryce Young, hope he figures it out year three. It turns to get another guy. It doesn't mean give up on Bryce Young and trade him. You can keep two in the fold, but it means that they're going to be in the quarterback market, in my opinion. Keep another horse in the stable. Yeah, there you have it. All breaking right. news. That's our first real breaking news here on Pushing the Pile. So thanks. It's been quite an experience here in the breaking news segment. We are getting ready to do some overreaction versus reality, but the Bryce Young ticker pops up. All right. Bryce Young, no longer the star of the Carolina Panthers less than a year and a half after he was drafted there. We're going to get to our favorite moments of the week. Obviously, that was one of our least favorite moments of the week right after this. We're back breaking down the last of week two. Last thoughts. Favorite moment from the week that was? Dude, favorite moment for me was the Las Vegas Raiders traveling east, going to play at M&T Bank Stadium, getting after the Ravens, who were out to a lead there late in the game. And I remember there was a certain point in the game, Gardner Minshew throws a pick. He goes to the sideline, and who's waiting for him other than Max Crosby, the all-pro over there? And he's just pounding on Gardner's chest and motivating him, being the ultimate teammate that you want. That's a team. That's a football team. The Raiders are a football team. They don't have all the star power in all those spots, but Max Crosby able to get his guy and his guys rallied for the victory. I love that. Yeah, love the Raiders – you know, I don't think anyone has any aspirations of Super Bowl or even playoffs at this point, but that's a team that's easy to root for, given how hard that defense plays. My favorite moment, Green Bay Packers. Count it out after Jordan Love. You should have seen their odds of making the playoffs after that injury. Malik Willis, 
That offense, 53 carries, 270 Heroic yards. effort. Freakish stuff on that ground game as the Packers have the 16-10 dominant win. There you have it. The week two recap on Pushing the Pile. Make sure to check us out in podcast format Monday through Thursday, 9.30 a.m. The power rankings Going tomorrow. live every single week. We got power rankings with Pete Prisco, Pit, Pit, Prisco tomorrow. LeJay Doosable joins on Wednesday to do some deep dives across the NFL. And then we recap on Thursdays. Hope you guys can join Get us. Get your mailbag questions in early. Until next time, keep pushing.